So we move on to the next module on vehicular wireless network. These are called vehicular ad hoc networks or VANETs. And so we talk about the VANET architecture, application, requirements, routing, etc. And then we talk about a standard which is called DSRC or WAVE, dedicated short range communication. And this is also known as 802.11p, which will come up when we talk about DSRC. So we are still in 11. So vehicular ad hoc networks. Basically, the idea is that, that soon the cars will be able to talk to each other and um, communicate. If you don't like somebody doing something, you can send them a text right away. <laughs> Actually, that is not the main reason. Main reason is that um, you would be able to get information just like you get on your smartphone driving directions, restaurants, and things like that, you could be able to get in the car. And so, when it will allow cars to talk to cars and cars to talk to the rest of the world, right? So, dynamic topology with nodes moving at a very fast speed. So, what is different about when it is, whatever we have discussed so far, we have gotten through distance is a small distance, large distance, medium distance, very small distance. Now we are coming into speed. We are talking about high speed mobility. We are talking in one car which is moving at 60 miles per hour on this side, another one going at 60 miles per hour on the other side. Very high speed mobility. So those are the issues. And dynamic topology. Second thing is nobody is staying at one place. So, so everybody is moving very fast. So the topology changes and uh, more processing power, storage and energy than handles. In the case of phones, there is a problem. You cannot have too much computing, too much storage and too much energy. With cars, we don't have that problem at least. Um, and location based information is more important. So basically you want to know what is happening where I am in the location. Okay, so if you are in St. Louis, you want to know what the weather in St. Louis, accident in St. Louis, a lot more than anywhere else, right? Delay constraints, and you want the current information, you don't want something which is half an hour old. You know, it's, there was an accident half an hour ago, it's not of interest. Varying environments, and there are all kinds of uh, highways, roads, streets, tall buildings, open areas. And then the sensors, GPS, speed, proximity. And so the cars come with all these sensors, which are GPS sensor, speed sensor, proximity sensor, engine sensor, etc. So there is a lot of, there are lots of sensors in the car that want to communicate their information. Okay. Now, um, in terms of the references, there are two books here, and unfortunately, this book disappeared because of the picture. Um, but you can still find it using that. Um, this is actually is much more recent than this one. So I just found this new book. However, oh, the year is gone. I think it is more like 2014, but it's gone. So I will have to fix that in next version. But you can find by author's name or by title or by ISPN. So basically, the terms that we use in VANETs are vehicle to infrastructure. So there would be on the roadside, there could be some towers. Actually, they won't look like towers because they would be just hidden antennas somewhere. But let's call them towers. So those are called infrastructures. Right, and then vehicle is called V, so the communication could be V to I or V to V. Right, vehicle to infrastructure or vehicle to vehicle. 
and these things are called RSUs, roadside units are onboard units. Onboard units are in the car and the roadside units are on the road. And why would we use this for infotainment? Infotainment means information and entertainment. Information is like navigation and telecom and entertainment is you want to watch a movie. And um, minimize driver distraction such as Bluetooth and wi So basically, so to minimize the distraction, your telecom and navigation, everything will probably use Bluetooth and voice recognition. So, so I mean, there's a car network inside the car also, right? We're not talking about that network, which probably is Bluetooth, but we're talking about the network between the cars and the car to the roadside. Traffic control. If we have this communication, then the traffic congestion will go down. Fuel congestion will go down because Instead of having visual signal that you have today, you will get radio signals which will warn you ahead of time what is happening on the road. Safety um, and uh, basically crashes will be minimized because the, your speed, etc., can adjust to some of these communication signal that is coming in. And, um, and the sensors will, of course, help you avoid all the collision and um, you would be able to maintain the speed limit. Yeah. Right. Right, right. So, so there are two things which are happening. Many of these features, like the last four point, three points and he pointed out, they are there without any network. Right? So for the forward collision warning, you don't need somebody to tell me that there is forward collision coming in. You could just put a sensor, laser sensor, which will tell you that you are going to collide and you stop. Um, so, yes. Some of these features have come in without the banner. And one of my dissatisfaction has been that the banners has been talked about for a long time, but has not come in yet. You see? And um, so I kind of share the feeling with you that, you know, many of these things are coming in. But um, think of how, about a day when there is a driverless car. That, then I think banner will probably help more because the car can talk to other cars rather than right now we can listen to the radio. A lot of information comes through the radio and other places as to what is happening on the highway, but then it will come through the network. Mm -hmm. From what? Google car, yeah? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So it's, the Google car is without without network, but I think it will work better with network. Okay, I mean it's like this: you can have a car driven without a radio, but I think it's better with a radio, right? And so information is always better, right? And so this is this is similar to the other thing which is happening: is the whether the video. So we want to send videos to the network, right? And the network guys are always talking about, oh, we want to do quality of service, we want to do quality of service, and therefore we need to do this, this, this. They have just been talking about it while the video is already going. How is it going? Because the video guys have figured out that if we compress it enough, then we don't need to worry about the network. And if we cache it enough, we don't need to worry about the delays. So the application people have figured out a way without worrying about the infrastructure for the video. Same thing. Car people are figuring out both ways. One is that they're figuring out how can we do without the network, but the network guys are working on designing the network. So no, but that is actually visual. So right now, okay, again. 
So right now, as I said that right now we have visual in information. So I, when I drive on the highway, it tells me that seven minutes to route 270. All right. That information is there and I can read it. And so good that if it was not there, I think it will be kind of not very useful, but it is useful to me so that I, I, I can change my route if I want to. But just think about as more automation comes in, methods, visual methods may not work that well. Okay. Now let me give you another example. Right now, the way I know that I'm driving on the lane is there's a white line on the road. It's a visual method. What about if it was a radio method? Right? It will be better for the machines. So as we become more mechanized, all the visual things will go away and then we'll be more explicit information coming in from somewhere which says, no, you're off the lane, you're, you know. In that can detect the lane, but it's not perfect. See, the thing is, for every solution, there are multiple people, every problem, there are multiple people competing for the solution. Right? And so camera people are selecting and they're saying they, they can perfect the visual method. Right? And the network people are saying that we can do it by the network, radio method. But the camera has an issue with the sun. Yeah, I mean, camera issue in the night time and sun time and, and all kinds of visual noise. You know, if somebody flashes a light or something, you know, I mean, so, so at some point we will see. But let's just assume that we are networking guys. We want to de deliver a solution, right? So let's look from our point of view. If I was an image guy, maybe I would not worry about any of this. <laughs> we'll find an amazing solution to the problem. All right. Requirements. Highly critical messages. So there are messages, so the thing is not all messages are equally important. UEP we talked about a minute ago. So, so basically some messages are very critical. And um, so for example, warnings, toll collections, etc., etc. these are critical. Non-critical is the video. Short range, less than 300 feet. Mobility is very high and security. Now, less than 300 feet is just a number that they selected that, you know, I mean, I, I don't see any limit. I want to talk to a car maybe a mile ahead, but that would be even more difficult. So that's a number that people might have put that, okay, let's limit it to 300 feet. And security. So whatever we design has to meet these things, but it has to have priority or criticality, criticality it has to have mobility and security. For security, we talk about denial of service, impersonation, privacy, tampering, and so on and so forth. All right? Um, and for privacy, we said location, ID, and e-payment. You know, basically, um, if we had the information about all the toll booths, we can figure out who passed by the toll booth and where they are going, where they came by and all that. So you are losing some privacy because now, they can figure out exactly where you are and when, at what time. Um, in fact, that reminds me of a chart that somebody showed. So all they did was they got a telephone company information about location of the phones. Your location is continuously being recorded, right? So the phone company provided them the information without telling whose phone number it is. So they, they took over the phone number and they just said, okay, phone number one goes here, phone number two goes here, phone number three goes here. Now they can sit down and figure out who is his phone number one because phone number one spends so much time in Briar, um, Brian Hall daytime and then appears in let's say front neck where I live. They know it's, it, it is me, right? So by knowing where people are, they can figure out exactly who it is, right? So even though the phone number is not there, but the information is there. Right, so they could, they could figure out exactly whose phone is what. I mean, even in millions of phones. But anyway, so the thing is right now, privacy is just going away because everything we do is being recorded and that can be correlated. And tampering is the issue of um, your um, changing the sensor readings so that um, either somebody can do it to damage you or you can do something to fraud somebody else. 
Anyway, so security requirements are that um, we want to be able to collaborate. So we want to be able to do multi-hub communication. Now some of these are desires. And some of these may happen and may not happen. So multi-hub communication is that I, if I want to talk to him and he is no more than 300 feet away, I can send it to him and he can pass it on to her and so on and so forth. Finally, it gets to them. This has been talked about for quite some time, but it has not really happened because most people really don't want to be the router for anybody else. And so collaboration, that is required. Autonomy. Vehicles should be able to reject participation. So you cannot force anybody to do anything. Authentication. We have to know who sent it and is it really they sent it. Accountability. And so we should be able to figure out if this is going to change anything, is this something worth relying on? Privacy, location of the driver, name of the driver, vehicle type, etc. We want to keep it private. So how can we do that? Availability, vehicles should be usable even if the network is down. So obviously network will not always be up and will not always be available. So, so what do we do? And now, now for vanets, we have to cover everything. Again, the list is starts from broadcast. We should be able to tell everybody in the neighborhood. Geocast to tell everybody in the limited area. Forwarding, multi-hub we talked about. Clustering within a group, such as police is a cluster and they want to be able to talk to each other. Or fire people, they want to talk to each other. Beaconing is that um, basically, um, you know, we talked about beacon already, but basically the idea is that um, um, how do we coordinate, all right? And then position-based, geographical routing based upon position of the routers. So, so the thing with the car network is that because the position is going to change quite a bit every second, that is, uh, there is this location-based stuff that we have not discussed in the other parts of the network, other kinds of networks that have become very important. Delay tolerance, of course, we we have to make sure that the the sometimes the delay can be large. By the way, what does um, maybe delay tolerance? I haven't talked about, but there is something called delay tolerant networking (DTN). How many people know what is DTN? Anybody heard before? Nobody. Okay, so maybe I should explain. DTN, delay tolerant network. So what is a delay tolerant network? Actually, this is another idea which has been discussed for a long time in, in IETF for several years and it has not really happened. Is that, and this is started with the discussion on how do we talk to Mars. So if there is, you know, inter, they call it interplanetary communication. And um, so the idea is if you talk very long distances, then sometimes, you know, it is day and night and things like that. So communication may not be available. Right, and sometimes communication may, may become available. So they came up with the idea of delay tolerant network, where the router will store the information until the link becomes available. Okay, so you send something to a DTN router, it will hold it until it finds the next hop. If it doesn't find it, it will hold it. And it finds the next hop, it will send it to the next hop, and then next hop, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it will make it. So this is what you have to do for interplanetary communication because for days you may not be able to communicate and then you will communicate. And so there is a whole system of acknowledgements back from every router back to the source. So the source knows where this packet is, whether it has to retransmit or not, you know, things like that. So there is a whole system on DTN. Now this whole system has been designed. There are RFCs, but it has not been implemented. Okay. So, but anyway, here the word delay tolerant came up. So, I just wanted to explain that this for vehicular networks, we need delay tolerant networking because if I want to send some message to miles ahead, the car is right here. It can take the packet and take the packet with it a one mile and then deliver it over there. So, in fact, there are networks like that which are used in rural areas of actually not used, are experimented with because these are first concepts where they talk about how do you deliver news to the rural areas you, you it goes in the bus. Basically, the bus receives on a radio, it stores it. When it goes to the next town, 
you broadcast it, goes to the next town, broadcast it. Whatever question they have, they bring their question. When the come, bus comes to the town, gets the question, the answer is next bus. So, <laughs> so they are talking about information like that, where um, delay tolerant techniques will be used for communicating requests and responses. All right, I think I covered everything. Ad hoc. Ad hoc is that basically um, we should be able to do through the infrastructure based, which is on the roadside and without the roadside. So for Venet, they talked about several technologies. One is called DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communication, also known as 11P and 1609.124, 1609.1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, this can be used up to one kilometer at 200 kilometer per hour. So 200 kilometer per hour um, is the maximum speed that they have designed it for, and the distance is one kilometer. Then WiMAX was being discussed as one possibility. You can put a WiMAX tower and everybody can, you know, for miles people, cars can talk to it. Now, actually, WiMAX has become LTE, so I should change it to LTE. Same thing, you know, if you had an LTE-enabled car, it could talk to the tower for B2I. 3G could do the same thing. Uh, and um, with handoff, you could be continuously connected. Satellites can do, but the satellites are, while they are available everywhere, but um, their delays are kind of, large and the cost is high and so they are only used in areas where there is no other possibility like Middle East. <laughs> um, basically, um, if you are in the middle of nowhere, uh, of course there is no tower, nothing, then satellites are always there, right? So the satellite phone is there, for example, I don't know how many of you have used satellite phones, but they are available and they are used only when you are in the sea or something like that where there is no tower. And uh, same thing for here, for technology, for Venet. So anyway, we are going to concentrate on DSRC, which is 11P. So DSRC spectrum is from 5.8 to 5.9 gigahertz. Okay, so this is very close to that other 5.8 spectrum we had, but it is different. So you cannot use your 11 A, B, C, D, E, F, G, S devices in this one. This is a different band. It is um, 850 to 925. You can see there is a 75 megahertz. You take the last two digits. So 7, 10 megahertz channels out of those 75 you can make. Now, these channels are numbered like this. 172, 173, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to 180. Now, the channels are 5 megahertz. Numbering is by 5 megahertz, but usage here is by 10 megahertz and therefore only 172, 174, only even number channels are being used, right? Because when you use 172, you are probably using 172, 173, right? 10 megahertz. Anyway, so 7, 10 megahertz channels are used. Channel 178 is used as the control channel. Okay, and it will become clear as to what is control for. And the 174, 176, 80, and 82. 74, 76, 80, and 82. They are used as service channels. Channel 184 is reserved for future. So this is not even used right now. High availability, low latency. So there is this thing where very quickly you want to get something through, very high priority. So that is for that. And channel 172 is not used. So anyway, basically out of seven, only five are used. One is a control channel and four are service channels. Different EIRP for four classes. So there are four classes of service and different power limits. Okay, now these power limits are set by FCC. OBU 
can transmit 33 dBm, our SU can transmit 43 dBm and 33 dBm if it is somebody else. So the government can transmit 43, other people have to limit to 33. First of all, OBU. OBU, if you remember, what is OBU? Onboard unit means the car. The car can transmit at what is what power? 33 dBm. Right, and this is EIRP. So we measure it in the direction. If you have an antenna of 10 dBm, then you can transmit 23. Less 10 added to that will become 33. RSU is the roadside unit. And if it is owned by the government, it is 43 dBm. If it is owned by somebody else, 33 dBm. Now the protocol itself has many components. So there are two planes to begin with. There is management plane and the data plane. The management plane includes security and the management. The data plane includes, the, basically does the data transfer. So data plane is done by IEEE, mostly. So in the data plane, IEEE did the file layer, uh, 802.11p, and the MAC layer, 1609.3 and 4. The logical link layer is a standard for all 802 protocols, which is 802.2. And then there is, on, on the top of this, you need network layer. So there are two possibilities. Either you can take IPv6 and TCP UDP, or you can go through this something called WSMP, Wave Short Message Protocol, which is done by ASTM. <coughs> ASTM is a Testing Material Society, Association of something. Testing Material, TM is for Testing Material. So totally non-computers people. So they come up with this, um, they probably needed this um, this kind of protocol for whatever application. So they came up with this WSMP first. And so then it goes, the rest of it goes over this stack like this. And most of us will go through this. And where UDP and TCP are there, but TCP is not advised. So they just want to do UDP. Because TCP has a problem that you need the acknowledgement and it may never come. On the management plane side, there is a management for 802.11p, which is designed by IEEE. So it is called physical layer management entity for 11p. Then there is a MAC layer management entity, which is for 11 and for 1609 extension for that. So there are two different committees working at the same time on this and coordinating. And then 1609 people have also come up with the rest of the management part here. And then they have a security part. So if you were to implement any of this, you will have to read a lot of standards. And some of these they will cover in this class. And some of these will be may not. But um, basically you can see that how you know how complex complex it is. There is 11, 1609, and in different pieces they're intermeshed. As long as they're all IEEE, they all work out okay. And, and then sometimes it goes out of IEEE, like here, ASTM. Even I wonder how the coordination between 1609 and 11 works, because these are very different. I have been to 11 meetings, 802 meetings, but not to 1609 meetings, although I'm on both, both the lists. But 1609 meets separately. I mean, they, they don't meet at the same place as the 802 meets. So I don't know how they coordinate. But I mean, of course, they can always coordinate by by sending people to both the meetings. But anyway, um, so let's go slowly, piece by piece. So first thing is wave, wireless access per vehicular environment. Okay, um, and we saw the word for DSRC and wave right here. Where was wave? Um, 
then WSMP, Visa WSMP, which is um, ASTM standard. What it does is it indicates what is the priority, what is the data rate and power, how far should it go. And it was developed by American Society for Testing and Materials. Okay. The wave management entity is 1609. And then wave security is 1609. So that 1609 security does in data encryption and key management. Management does the registration, data rate, and power for different applications. I talked about that. Um, and